We are wrestling. We are wrestling. They give a shout out to We Are Wrestling on YouTube. You're watching We Are Wrestling. Oh. I'm the host with the most. You are by far the least intelligent. What's going on, everybody? Danny Huckins here, man. One third of We Are Wrestling. Uh, what's going on? We Are Wrestling Maniacs Worldwide. Ben here, the third of the talk show. We Are Wrestling Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, baby. And we, we are wrestling. What is up? We are Wrestling Maniacs out there worldwide. I'm the host with the most, the best one, Dottie, here with... What is going on, everybody? Danny Huckins here, man. One third of We Are Wrestling. Me and Donnie riding solo this week. Ben had other things that he had to take care of. But Donnie, man, we have a we have a jam-packed show today, man. What's going on? We do. We have a jam-packed show, and this is the 50th episode of the We Are Wrestling podcast which is absolutely crazy. It's funny because episode 40, it was you and Ben because I was out with COVID, and now it's you and I for episode 50. Just like where we started, episode one, you and me. But before, you know, we get into the topics for this week on the We Are Wrestling podcast, if you're not a We Are Wrestling maniac yet already, and you're not a part of the thousands of subscribers, The best way to support us is by hitting that subscribe button now, turning on the post notifications, videos be coming out of nowhere, like an RKO, and of course, you already know, the grind is real. Yeah, bro. So, this week on the podcast, Danny, what are we going to start off talking about? Well, this this wasn't originally on the docket, man, but we decided to add it last minute and swipe out something else. Um, I read a lot in the dirt sheets, man. I'm 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 a I'm a I'm a whore for the dirt sheets, especially making like doing the podcast with you, and you know you got to have knowledge and you got to have things to talk about or whatever. I'm always looking at the dirt sheets. So apparently, Impact alumni Davey Richards, man, is going through shit to the point to where a lot of Indie promotions and a lot of promotions that that worked closely with him, they're cutting ties with him, man. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, he was part of the American Wolves and Impact, former Impact uh, Tag Team Champ, one half of uh, Impact Tag Team Champions. I remember they had a feud with the Hardys. Uh, I think that was around the time Matt Hardy uh, first returned to Impact because uh, I remember he went to WWE and then he ended up coming back. And I believe it was the Wolves that challenged them to a match in New York City. I watched that clip a lot. Man, the Wolves were so good in TNA. And the Wolves around that time in TNA, that was like the last couple years. I like stopped watching TNA. It was after the Wolves. Yep. Because, of course, you know, nobody has access to access TV. But with Davey Richards, you know, hearing these reports, these allegations – going around, you know, about, like, domestic violence and stuff. I really hope it's not true because, you know, Davey is a very talented, you know, professional wrestler. He right now has been doing a lot of work in the independent circuit and, you know, MLW. I believe he's one of their champions over there. But it looks like a lot of independent promotions are cutting tides with him due to a lot of these allegations. And something we know in pro wrestling in 2000, you know, 20s, is that, you know, things that you do, you have repercussions. We saw the speaking out movement in 2020. It affected a lot of, you know, wrestlers. One of them, you know, Marty Skrulls, who I think after his Ring of Honor contract was up around that time, he could have been, you know, a part of AEW with, you know, his buddies, the elite. But due to some of the stuff that happened, he, you know, Just, he hasn't been on TV since. He's been working, you know, very quiet, independent shows. And with Davey Richards, with these reports, it's not looking good for him. 
No, it's not. And like, you know, we do want to reiterate, like nothing has been proven in a court of law. These are just allegations, you know, don't go like as far as I know, he did deactivate his Twitter or whatever. But like, don't go online, like attacking the guy, because regardless, like we're just fans, you know, even though me and Donnie are podcasters, we don't have any like inside knowledge. You know, we don't know what transpired. You know, I will I will say there's a lot of females that are very vindictive and they'll make up stories or whatever so they don't seem like the bad guy in a lot of situations. Not saying that's the case here, but we don't know. So, we, you know, we're not in the business to be attacking somebody unless, you know, all the facts are proven. And the um, message here with this topic is domestic violence isn't okay. Man or female. Domestic male violence is or never female. okay. Exactly. Uh, San, but uh, St. Louis Anarchy, they cut ties with him. Um, Team Ambition, well, I'm not quite sure who St. Louis Anarchy and Team Ambition are, but they cut ties with him. Uh, Prestige Wrestling, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, they cut ties with him. You know, so I mean, maybe there's maybe there's something to these allegations, but again, we don't know. We don't have any inside st- scoops or anything like that. So nothing is a hundred percent confirmed here. And, you know, these are all allegations at the end of the day. But in professional wrestling, you have allegations against you that are very serious, like, you know, domestic violence. It is going to follow your entire career. And Davey Richards is 40 years old. He, you know, has retired from the business a few times, I believe, after certain runs he had with, you know, promotions. I think that Davey Richards, the best thing he's probably going to do is retire again and go back to doing his regular job, which I believe he was doing firefighting, I think. Yeah. Before he I got mean, back into pro wrestling again. I mean, to think about, like, you know, doing, like, a pro wrestling show or whatever and a lot of, like, like if you do, even if you do have allegations and, like, you know, it turns out that's all they are. You know, these promoters or whatever, they have a lot of money into this. You know, they have, you know, females, they have, you know, kids, they have a lot of a lot of people that attend their shows and they they can't risk. Could you imagine the like, you know, the re- reliability of, you know, somebody being accused of something and then something happens at one of these shows, the amount of shit that the promoters would get. So, I mean, you really can't be upset at the promoters for cutting ties with them, at least until this whole thing gets strained out you can't blame any of the promoters because even to this day when a promoter tries to bring in alberto del rio or they try to bring in what's her name tessa blanchard if they try to bring in marty scrolls they always get backlash for what about that dude that what about that dude that was working at disney and he recently got fired i can't remember his name he was in like he was in like nwa or something like that you were, no, you were I, I don't even know, man. I haven't been following NWA for a while. <laughs> he was dating a, another female performer or whatever, and, like, you know, he has some kind of, like, allegations against him or whatever, and no company will hire him. He can't do indie bookings. He was working at SeaWorld or Disney or something like that, and somebody, you know, it, it came out that he was working there, and he immediately got fired again. And that's the thing, man. With these allegations, they're very serious, and... Even if these reports are even saying that, like, he doesn't have, you know, even regular visitation rights with his children, too. So there must be something to it. But I really don't want to dive too deep into the whole Davey Richards thing. I think the real, the big message here is, you know, domestic violence is not okay, man or woman. And, you know, there's, you know, always you can get help and stuff for that type of stuff. But exactly. moving on now, you know, to the next topic on this week's episode of the We Are Wrestling Talk Show. A certain WWE superstar, Ridge Hollins, has been receiving death threats from Big E fans. And the question here with this topic is, do you think fans are taking this whole Big E injury thing too far with Ridge Hollins? I have a lot I have a lot to say on this subject. Um Pro wrestling fans are the scummiest motherfuckers on the planet. Um, You know, pro wrestling is not fucking ballet. It's not, you know, it's not going out and having fun with your friends on a fucking trampoline and bouncing up and down. You know, every single, there's not a time to where they go through that curtain, walk down to the ring to where, 
you know, they're not putting their life on the line in some fashion. And everybody that's in the pro wrestling business knows that. You know, there's been a lot of instances. The guy in Mexico, you know, a simple 619, Eddie Guerrero, I mean, uh, Rey Mysterio, you know, he ended up passing away. Like, there's been a lot of instances, you know, with Vinny Lax, uh, Dan, Dan Quirk Spider, you know, did a simple moonsault and, you know, ended up passing away. This is not ballet. You know, people assume that pro wrestling, oh, it's scripted. So it must, everything must, you know, it must, all the, the flooring must be foam and the ring must be like springy, like a trampoline. Only and, if they went inside a ring, Danny, they would know. <laughs> I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. And I mean, if you honestly think that Rich Holland did that on purpose, you're a fucking moron, first of all. And... You know, even Xavier Woods had to go on Twitter to be like, bro, like, this is not okay. This is not an okay thing to do. And you know how close Xavier Woods and Kofi and Big E are. And apparently, I read a report that after the incident happened, Ridge Holland uh, checked up on Big E at his house and brought him an entire box full of fucking, like, grade A, like, steaks and shit like that as, like, sort of like an apology, you know? Yeah, like, like Big E even forgave him too after all the things that happened. Like he knew it was an accident. It could have had. It could have happened to Rich Holland. It Big E could have did. You know, done a belly to belly suplex or whatever. And you know what? Rich Holland could have got injured. Like any time these guys are going in that ring, somebody could potentially end their life. That's just the way of the fucking business, man. And the fact that there's actually fans that think that. You know, Ridge did this on purpose. They're fucking idiots, man. I, I tell you a lot. Like, I love our audience. I love the people that watch us and listen to us. But wrestling fans are the scummiest fucking group of people on this fucking planet. And, you know, the more and more I do this, I do the podcast and I, you know, I do any kind of wrestling related content. I'm starting to fucking realize this. Oh, yeah, we definitely signed up for that. My thoughts on the whole Ridge Hollins, you know, receiving death threats definitely proves what you're saying when it comes to, you know, wrestling fans being the most scummiest, you know, people on the planet. Because that's one thing, like, now, if Ridge Hollins did it intentionally, which I highly doubt he did it intentionally because he felt bad immediately afterwards then I would understand why fans would be frustrated with him. But we're in a business where these guys are professional wrestlers. They're on the road wrestling 300 days a year, and they're always putting their bodies on the line, and accidents happen. We've seen it, you know, throughout the years in pro wrestling. We've Draws, had guys man. That perfect had example. Draws. Draws is the perfect example, yes. Fucking exactly. uh, a tombstone pile driver or a pile driver D-Lo, by D'Lo, D-Lo Brown. Brown. Yep. And, you know, the dude's been paralyzed ever since. Like, accidents happen, bro. And that's the thing. When these pro wrestlers, you know, go to training school to train to become a pro wrestler, they know the risk that they're taking into the ring. And Big E knows it was accidental what happened. Even Ridge Hollins, you know, I know for a fact he didn't mean to do it. Especially if you're a WWE superstar and, you know, something like this happens. You know it's not intentional, especially the Big E who, you know, from reports that I see, a lot of, you know, superstars out there love Big E. He's one of the nicest guys in the locker room and one of, you know, the wrestler's favorites. Exactly. That are in there. And, like, there's a huge reason why, you know, not anybody can just be like, oh, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. You know, I have my first show today. No training or no th- nothing. I'm going to become a pro wrestler. Like, there's a reason why you have to go through a training. You have to go through all this, you know, physical conditioning and stuff like that. There's reasons for it. Because if you're not capable of doing something, then guess what? You're not meant to be a pro wrestler. And for the little few fans, I don't know if there is any that's probably watching this. Probably not, because we are wrestling maniacs. They know, you know, the risk and they know the things with, you know, professional wrestling. If you have doubts about this, A show I recommend you to watch is WWE Tough Enough. You can see all the grit. You can see all the pain that they have to go through, the training. You get to see it all on that show. Go watch freaking Hardcore Holly. 
Go watch exactly. Triple H on that show. See what the hell Bill DeMott does to these people. You know, being a professional wrestler is no joke at all. The bumps, they're real. You're in front of a crowd, so when you're taking a bump, you have to get right back up. That's just how it is in pro wrestling because you have over 10,000 people watching you at a time. Exactly, and like... You know, Biggie is probably what three hundred and forty pounds, and that pure muscle, muscle weighs he- is heavier than fat. So the idea of you know picking somebody up of his size and fucking throwing him over your head, you know, uh, I mean, do you know how many times Ridge Hollins has done this move to Biggie at WWE live events and nothing happened? It was accidental, and if you think that Ridge Hollins did this intentionally to Big E, then you are fucking delusional, and you should not even be a wrestling fan, period. Because I understand why fans, I understand why some, you know, these people that call themselves fans, why they're upset that Big E is hurt. He's, you know, one of the fan favorites. He's one of, you know, the best right now in WWE, and he's been on the shelf. But that doesn't mean... You have the right to go out and, you know, give friggin' Ridge Holland's death threats because of an accident that happened. And apparently his family was getting death threats and people were calling him a racist and people want him to lose his job and WWE to fire him. That's just wrong. That is just absolutely wrong. Like I said, bro, like, you know, I love our audience. I love people that watch us and support us because I would like to think that people that watch us are half decent human beings. But majority of pro wrestling fans are the scummiest people on the fucking planet, bro. Oh, because, so because they watch it because oh, hold they on a minute. Here's a perfect example, too. Remember SummerSlam back in the Ruthless Aggression era when Batista fought John Cena and John Cena almost broke his neck and he was out for about six months. I think so, yeah. That's exactly accidents happen. Even some of the best that are in this business, you know, accidents happen. Did Batista mean to hurt John Cena's neck? Absolutely not. But in this sport, you can't expect everything to be perfect. You can't. All of these professional wrestlers, at some point in their career, they have botched, they have made mistakes. Because at the end of the day, yes, they have the cameras, they have the lights, they have everything all on them. But at the end of the day, they're human beings just like us. Exactly, man. It's a live stunt show. It's the way you know I like to put it. So I encourage everybody that watches this this podcast, man, I encourage you guys, go on social media, go on Twitter primarily. It's what Rich Holland used. And tweet at him, man. Be like, I stand with Rich, you know, because the people, you know, I guarantee you the people that are, you know, sending him death threats, they don't have profile pictures. They have probably like 17 followers, They, you know, and they're following like 1,200 people, random Chinese accounts and all kinds of craziness. People are stupid, man. Definitely, you know, send some good vibes over to Ridge Hollins and, you know, also Big E as well, because I'm Mm -hmm. sure this is not, you know, this is pretty, this is definitely bothering Big E as well, because, you know, these are his fans. They say they're his fans and they're coming at Ridge Hollins with death threats, coming at his family with death threats. So I'm assuming it's definitely not hard. It's definitely hard for Big E as well. So please, guys, send good vibes over to both Ridge Hollins and Big E. It was an accident. Accidents happen in pro wrestling. But guys, we'll be right back with more topics for this week on We Are Wrestling Podcast. Saturday, June 17th, 2023. Both Captain's Corner and Zombie Hideout are bringing professional wrestling back to the New England area with the Wrestling Classic 3, which will be a wrestling convention bringing in some of the best wrestlers throughout the years at this event in Springfield, Mass. At the South End Community Center, you can meet Hall of Famers, Kurt Angle, Lex Luger, DDP, AEW stars, The Guns, and so many more classic stars to be announced on Saturday, June 17th. And for the first time ever, we are wrestling. We're going to be a vendor. We're going to be working with Zombie Hideout and Captain's Corner with this event. Best One Donnie has had the opportunity to go to both the Wrestling Classic 1 and 2. And let me tell you, the Wrestling Classic 3 is going to be like no other. And if you want to, you know, have an opportunity to meet some of the best in the business, they will be in Springfield, Mass. on Saturday, June 17th. 
South End Community Center in Springfield, Mass. Also, the We Are Wrestling team will be there with a table. We'll be having merchandise, and we'll also be giving away some stuff as well. And, of course, you already know, we'll be vlogging as well. You are definitely not going to want to miss this event. Get your tickets now. What is going on, guys? It's Ben here, the Lone Ranger, and you guys are watching We Are Wrestling Podcast. We're back. Before we get into our next topic for this week's episode of the We Are Wrestling Talk Show, since it's the 50th episode of the podcast, Danny and I, we have a huge announcement that we're going to be making. And if you're in the Western Mass area, you know We Are Wrestling. We love to work with, you know, some of these promotions in the area. And on Saturday, June 17th, We Are Wrestling. We are going to be a vendor for the Wrestling Classic 3. I'm sure we are wrestling maniacs. You have watched both of the wrestling classic blogs. I've been to two of these conventions by Captain's Corner. And this year, not only is Captain Captain's Corner putting on this event, this event, Zombie Hideout is also going to be teaming up with them. Two of our favorite, you know, wrestling guys that bring in, you know, wrestlers in the New England area are working together to put on one of the biggest events of the year in Springfield, Mass at the South End Community Center. The We Are Wrestling crew, myself, Danny, Ben, and Old School Chaz, we are going to be there on Saturday, June 17th. We're going to have a table. We're going to be having some merchandise. We're also going to be having a wheel giving away stuff to the kids. You're definitely not going to want to miss it. How do you feel about this, Danny? I mean, I, I feel great, man. I've never, I've never been to a wrestling convention. And the fact that you know we're vendors slash guests, whatever you want to call it, we're gonna be there. It's kind of weird to me. And like, Godfather's gonna be there. Teddy Long is gonna be there. Kurt Angle is gonna be there. Marty Jannetty just got announced. He's gonna be there, bro. It's, it's gonna be fucking huge. If you guys are in the Connecticut, Massachusetts area, man, we urge you guys to come out. Link and everything for ticket info is gonna be in the description along with the address. Make sure you guys come on out and. You know, say hi to us, man. Come say hi. We're definitely going to be vlogging this, and it's definitely going to be an experience like no other. Wrestling Classic 3 going to be one of the biggest wrestling conventions in the New England area. We're going to be there Saturday, June 17th. But with the next topic on this week's episode of the We Are Wrestling Talk Show, this past Wednesday on AEW Dynamite, we saw the debut of Taya Valkyrie. She is all elite. How do you feel about this move for AEW? Like, I knew it was going to be Taya um, because, you know, this whole thing with Jade, like, I was kind of skeptical. Like, once Jade came out or whatever, you know, she was saying that she wanted to face somebody from Canada. At first, I thought it was going to be Renee because, you know, like, she started to get in Renee's face. And we even saw the same thing on Wednesday. And then when Taya came out, um, you know, I... I knew her impact contract ran out. I knew she was going to go somewhere. I didn't know where. I probably I I I, I knew she wasn't going to go back to WWE just because of, you know, how she how she left last time. You know what's um, funny about that? Before she was all elite, there were reports that like WWE and AEW were both, you know, competing for her and a lot of people were saying she was going to go back to WWE. I thought that that was comical. No, like, you know, if you, if you, Chris Van Vliet did an interview with her shortly after she got released, and she was literally crying about, you know, how her time in WWE was. Yeah, she, you know, did not enjoy it or whatever. I think, I think she got released, and then shortly after, John, uh, her husband, John Morrison, got released. So they both got released around the same time, around when they were doing the budget cuts and stuff like that during, like, uh, the pandemic era when they were wrestling in front of no fans. Uh, but the way she left, I knew she wasn't going to go back to WWE. I wasn't quite sure she was going to go to AEW either. And I know it sounds weird. I mean, mm-hmm. I if I if I were to guess before this entire thing happened, I would have said maybe she resigns with Impact, but I wasn't quite sure. Maybe it does New Japan and stuff like that. My thing is, you know, to- we seen we seen people like Tony Storm. We've seen people like Athena. We've seen people like Ruby So. We've seen people like Soraya. Like all these people have, you know, who were bigger names. They transitioned to AEW, and for whatever reason, it just seems like you know they are they never end up becoming a needle mover for the women's division. 
And I'm just I'm very skeptical about how Tony Khan is gonna book Taya Valkyrie. Like, you know what I mean? Even though she like she can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't book her the way she needs to be booked, and like with the with the limited amount of TV time that they have, you know, I don't expect everybody to be like a main event player. But I mean, with a lot of these people, I mean, look at Saray and Tony Storm and Ruby Soho. That's the stupidest fucking faction I've ever heard of in my fucking life, bro. The promo that they cut on Wednesday, fucking atro- atrocious, bro. Ruby Soho like gave me hope that this faction was going to work. I gotta say, Tony Storm did a good job on the promo on Wednesday, but Ruby Soho and Soraya, they looked lost. Like they needed Dora's map. <laughs> and I'm glad. I am really happy that. Ty Valkyrie, because I we knew whoever this person was that was going to wrestle Jade on Wednesday, we knew that they were automatically going to lose. I don't see Jade losing until Chris Statlander comes in. I do believe yes. that she's going to be in the running to take the TBS title off of her. So I knew whoever this w- woman was going to be, you know, was going to lose. I'm so fucking glad Tony had the, uh, enough sense to be like, let's not make Jade's opponent. Taya because we know she's gonna lose Why would Taya lose on her debut That would just diminish all the value That you know she has built up All the credi- credibility she's built up Over the last year or two It would have just went right out the window So I'm really happy about that Absolutely right and one thing you Mentioned was needle Mover and that is something AEW when it comes to the women's Division they are definitely lacking Is a needle mover And I feel like the only way AEW is going to be able to get one of those is if, you know, they do have a performance center or something because, let's be honest, in WWE, the reason why the women's division is hotter than it's ever been is because of the four horsewomen, which now there's three left. But let's be honest, they really, you know, started a new chapter in women's wrestling. And, like, look at all, you know, the accolades that Charlotte Flair has. I know you don't like her, but she does have a lot of accolades. Becky Lynch, she's also got a lot of accolades. bailey has got a lot of accolades. Now we're seeing Bianca Belair. We're seeing homegrown WWE talent. And that's the thing I've always said here on, you know, the We Are Wrestling podcast, old school versus new school, hot takes. The times in professional wrestling where they strive is when they create and establish their own superstars. Why I do you will think say, the opening of AEW Dynamite, you had the four pillars of AEW, and it was one of the best segments in AEW Dynamite history to start I, off the show. I will say, you know, I do love the fact that, you know, for the main, for the most part. All the all the main event people, all the you know people that are you know champions or whatever in AEW are homegrown talent. We got Powerhouse Hobbs, we got MJF, we got uh, Jamie Hader, we got Jay Cargill, we got the Guns. So you know, Orange I love Cassidy. Fa- Orange Cassidy. I love the fact that just because all oh, this person was a big deal in WWE, let's give him a championship. You know that way, all you know all the momentum that they had over here. They can come over here and have the same kind of moment. It's not the way. It's not the way things work. You know what I mean. And here's here's one thing that I I also do want to mention. And I can't remember. I have to look at the notes. I can't remember if you had this as one of the topics or whatever. But AEW is supposedly going to be having a new show. Uh, it's going to be called AEW Collision. It's going to be from like six oh five to like seven p.m. on Saturday nights. Horrible fucking time slot. Um, Why here's, can't we just get another two hour show? Here's what I would do. So stupid. all right. Here's what I would do. You guys can agree with me. You guys can disagree with me. Whatever. What the fuck ever. I, I I'm one of the hosts of the show. You're not. <laughs> so I would have, I would have AW Dynamite on Wednesday, eight to ten, like it is now. I would have, I would have AW stay in the town two nights. I would have on Thursday, eight to ten, AW Rampage. Make Rampage live. So you have two hours Wednesday, two hours Thursday, move Ring of Honor to Saturdays from yes. like maybe like eight to nine or nine to ten. Seems like a pretty good time slot. That's yes. what I would fucking do. They should be they staying do not- in the city for two nights. I absolutely agree with you 100%. You couldn't have said it any better. They do not need to be having another hour show. Nobody watches Rampage as it is. And the fact that 
You know, who's who in their right fucking mind? Somebody, you know, on another podcast brought this up. Who in their fucking right mind is going to be all, you know, it's it's Saturday in the middle of summer. I'm going to go to the beach, guys, but I I got to I got to be home by six. I got to watch AW Collision. I, I, it's, <laughs> it's musty. <laughs> That's so true, though. Like, if Rampage is only getting, like, 300,000 people, like, I don't even think they're going to hit 100,000. <laughs> Especially, like, if it if it, if it premiered during the winter. The That's great. If, if it premiered during the winter, maybe it would have a chance. But the fact that this is probably not going to pick up until around June, which is uh, going to be the start of the summer, everybody's going to be out going on vacation. Who the fuck is going to want to watch an hour pro wrestling show on a fucking Saturday? I'm not Get watching it on a Saturday. <laughs> Make AW Dynamite Wednesday night, 8 to 10, live. Rampage, 8 to 10, live on Thursday. Move Ring of Honor Saturday. There you fucking go, man. Stay in the city for two nights. Sell out the same fucking building. Even if you want, fucking add a combo package. You can get a ticket to Dynamite and Rampage for a little bit extra cost and tax. There you fucking go. Congratulations. I can book your show better than you. Honestly, Danny, it took you 50 episodes to have probably your best take on We Are Wrestling. I hey, I come up with applause. I come up with some good shit, applause. bro. Here, bow, you... bow, bow to the maniacs. Bow to the maniacs. That was I come fantastic. Up, wow. I come up with some I come up with some good shit, man. You guys don't give me credit. Oh, I gave you credit for that one. That was good. Took you 50 episodes for me to give you an applause. But, you know, getting back, you know, into, you know, like pretty much the pillars and the needle movers. There's a reason why in the AEW's women's division, the fans love Jamie Hayter. Why the fans love Thunder Rosa. Why the fans love Dr. Britt Baker. Chris Statliner. Because they're homegrown talent in AEW. And that's the problem with the women's division. They're trying so hard to shove Soraya down her throats, Tony Storm down her throats, you know, Ruby Soho down her throats. And what they need to do is just relax, book them calmly, and the fans will, you know, they'll cheer for them or they'll boo for them. But it won't be as bad as the booking is right now. So now getting into Taya Valkyrie now, I love this move. For the simple fact that she knows how to work in the ring. She, you know, hasn't really had an opportunity to show what she can do on a big stage. She has done, you know, fantastic work for AAA. She's done great work for Impact Wrestling for a couple years. And even in NXT, you know, they didn't really utilize her that much. But the talent was there, just bad timing. I think this is a great move for AEW. They are, you know, lacking experienced women in the ring and somebody that hasn't really been in WWE, you know, coming to AEW, I think that she's going to strive. I think that this is a great move, you know, all around for her and AEW. It's a perfect fit. And her feuding with Jade Cargill, I like it because it's not the outcast. It's not the whole outcast versus AEW. And as long as they keep Taya Valkyrie away from the outcast and away from whatever's going on over there, I'm satisfied and I'm happy with this move. I keep Jade Cargill away from them too. And you know what I just thought of? I didn't even think about this until now. And this is going back to my other original statement, the, like about like how you know they should you know have Rampage live and this and that. Mm -hmm. If they were to move Ring of Honor to Saturdays, they'd be able to do live fucking shows. So yep. that adds even more credibility to what the fuck I just said. TK, fucking hire me. People are probably already going to think we're shills, but fucking hire me. I can make you money. That's right. <laughs> but I got to say, like, this is a great move overall, though, for AEW. And I just hope they tie about three. Like, you know, we've seen our Northeast wrestling and stuff like that. You know, like, I hope they utilize her. But I just I have with everybody that's coming into AEW, you know, and even you have somebody like Jeff Jarrett, who's on TV weekly, who he shouldn't. Like, I, I still don't understand how you have a guy like Jeff Jarrett. And I understand Jeff Jarrett's a fucking legend. The dude, like, knows his way around. Yeah, you he's know, done he's a fantastic job putting over Orange Cassidy. He has, but I still don't understand why somebody like him is on TV Weekly. But yet, where the fuck is Miro, bro? 
Well, with Miro, is Miro, unfortunately, with Miro, he wants to be booked a certain way, and they don't really have anything crazy for him, so it doesn't make sense to throw him in a Jeff Jarrett story. Put him in Jarrett's a fucking powerhouse Hobbs. The last time the TNT title was credible was when was when Miro was fucking champion, the Redeemer. Put him in a feud with powerhouse Hobbs. I agree How with you. How fucking hard is that? I do agree with you. But I'm just saying why Jeff Jarrett's on the card is because he's putting these AEW talent over. That's fine. I, I like, you know, if he wants to do if he wants to do a segment here and there, I'm fine with Trust it. me, I want Miro back on TV too, just like Roger I mean, Strong. I want that man back on NXT, or not even NXT. I want him on the main roster already. He's been in NXT longer than Monday Night Nitro. It's I crazy. Know. Um I I don't think Jeff Jarrett, even though he like you know he's doing good for the business, he's doing good for AEW. I don't think it needs to be a weekly thing, though. You know, I think he, you know once, twice a month. You know, have him, you know, be a producer. You know, work backstage. You know, the other times he's not on. You know, used on TV or whatever. I just like you know he's had he's had his time. AEW doesn't have the TV time to keep up with everybody that they have signed. Jeff Jarrett's or- he's. Or he what went they up should do down. with Jeff Jarrett, Danny, is put him on Rampage or Collision and put talent over on there. Uh, that Collision shit is a fucking waste of time. It is money. a waste of time, but I'm just saying, with an hour, you have two shows that have an hour you need to fill. Why don't you put a veteran like Jeff Jarrett on there that could definitely, you know, do something? I don't know if you've noticed this, but Jeff Jarrett's not exactly the needle mover that his fan club thinks he is. The dude is the dude is talented. The dude, you know, he's a legend in the business. He's went up and down the roads, did what he had to do, won championships. But even when he was on fucking like in the beginning of the Attitude Era, 97, 98, he he still wasn't a fucking Jeff Jarrett has never legitimately been a needle mover, I don't think. Only I think in TNA he was with the six-sided ring in the asylum. He was him and his dad started fucking TNA. We wouldn't have impact wrestling if it wasn't for Jeff Jarrett. Give the guy his fucking roses. Like the guy, you know, he's earned he's yeah, earned but here's the, the thing though. Here's the thing about his TNA thing. He was a fantastic worker, but the reason why he doesn't get the credit where it's due is because it was him and his dad's promotion. Exactly. But like the guy he's He's, you know, he's done a lot for the business. He's got, he's, he deserves his roses. You know, he has every right to tell everybody to go fuck themselves. I've done this shit. You know, you, there's nothing you can say about, you say, tell me about the business that I don't already know. I just, with the limited amount of TV time AW has and TK trying to fill up time slots, like there's at least one or two matches every single fucking week on Dynamite. And I'm like, does this need to take place here? I mean, you know, you couldn't have found Very time true. on fucking Dark or Dark Elevation or fucking... Why is Claudio and Will Yuta... I thought they were supposed to, like, separate Ring of Honor guys from AEW. Why are they on AEW and Ring of Honor? I gotta say, I can't complain about Claudio and Wheeler, man. I can't I'm either, loving, but... I'm loving what they're doing right now with the trios division. It's looking good. Yeah, it is, but I don't like why or why do we again? Why do we have Ring of Honor guys on AEW? And well, why, um, why does well, they're Claudio, also signed with AEW as well? Well, yes, but why does Wheeler and Claudio have special treatment? Why can't other people from Ring of Honor come over to AEW? It's things like that. Well, they've take, been doing take, that. They've take the having, Ring, take the Ring of Honor, more. take the Ring of Honor titles off of them. They don't need them. Have them strictly on AEW. Give another guy in Ring of Honor his fucking shot. It do, they don't need to fucking be doing Ring of Honor and AEW. It makes so you're gonna give these guys special treatment because of who they are. Well, what about the other fucking seventy five guys you have signed to Ring of Honor that on, that barely get used? You know, remember that article that came out recently? A bunch of guys during the debut episode, a bunch of guys got pulled off of you know indie bookings or whatever because they were needed for Ring of Honor. Half of them didn't even get fucking used. Very true. Absolutely. There's a lot of things that Tony Khan's got to do. Definitely backstage needs to, you know, get some more help, I think. He's doing it all himself, and it's like, hi, get Moxie, get Jericho. Jericho just did an interview with Renee. He's saying that he, all the time, he's going over fucking storylines with different guys and helping them out and stuff like that. Fucking hire the guy on as a fucking writer. Very true. But moving on now to our next topic on this week's episode of the We Are Wrestling podcast. 
There are reports that Triple H wants to bring back, not Butch, but Pete Dunn. How should they book Pete Dunn's return when he decides to come back? The same as he was booked in uh, NXT. And could you imagine Pete Dunn having a match with Walter or Gunther on the main roster at a pay-per-view like SummerSlam? Same kind of fo- formula that they had on NXT Black and Gold, bro. Tear the fucking house down, man. Take my fucking wallet. Take my debit card. Take my house. I'm game for it. Here's what I think needs to happen with Pete Dunn. They need to bring they need to bring him back after Mania. They need to, you know, give this man a solid push, make him, you know, look like a legitimate threat. And I think going into Money in the Bank, because I think at WrestleMania, my thoughts, I think it's going to be a triple threat match with Gunter, Sheamus, and Drew McIntyre. I and think Sheamus Gunter should. Win. I think Gunter should retain the championship and be the champion all the way until Money in the Bank, and actually give Pete Dunne the championship. I think Pete Dunne beating Walter, ending the undefeated streak, could actually do more good for Pete Dunn's run than bad. And I think, you know, if you're going to want to get Pete Dunn over with the crowd, you need to do something like that with him. Because we've seen it. A lot of these Triple H guys, they have come back, and a lot of them aren't really getting reactions from the crowd. And that's the thing, like, with Pete Dunn coming back, I don't want it to be a situation like Butch, where Butch, you know, had, you know, no reactions or anything I want Pete Dunn to get those reactions, and what better way than to have him go against Gunter for the Intercontinental Championship at Money in the Bank in the UK and have Gunter put him over so that Gunter can go focus on the World Championship and Pete Dunn can, you know, be a solid Intercontinental Champion and have some very awesome matches for the rest of 2023. As much as I would, I would, I would fucking orgasm over the thought of that. I'm I'm still hell bent that that Sheamus is going to be Gunther on and like you know Gun- I I I have a feeling they're making it a triple threat match that way Gunther can lose the IC title without getting pinned so we can still have that no that no lose streak mm-hmm. so they're trying to do it they're trying to get the title off of him put it on Sheamus and do it in a way to where Gunther's not going to lose any credibility why else would they need to make it a triple threat match I can't think of any other reason why I can think of one. Because they want all three of these guys to be at WrestleMania because of how talented they are. I mean, there's other things that they could have done. Sheamus has, Sheamus has picked up a lot of momentum since Clash at the Castle. And that's why you're very high on him. Drew McIntyre has kind of been lost a little bit with feuds and stuff ever since, you know, the Thunderdome. You, you want to know where you want to know champion. Where, so him you being, you know, in this, you know, feud, I think gives him something to do at Mania because he has the talent and he deserves a spot at Mania. And you want to know where uh, champ. you want to know where Drew, Mac, Drew when Drew McIntyre lost his credibility. When he, he had he had he had that great storyline with Roman, bro, going into Clash of the Castle. Had a great fucking match. Everybody thought he was going to be in it. So, you know, it was the first night on the main roster that we saw Solo Sagoa. He loses the match, and then he ends up does, doing fucking karaoke with Tyson Fury at the end of the show. Which, to me, I still think that wasn't t- supposed to be shown broadcasting. I think that was supposed to be, you know, something that they did off air. But some asshole in the production cut, uh, the production cu- truck didn't fucking cut the cameras. That's what I think happened. And ever since then, bro, he's lost so much credibility because he's in this, you know, he's all fired up. You know, he's in his home area, his home country or whatever. You know, he's going for the world. He's world championship. He loses. And then he now he's just fucking singing. Like He definitely, crowd. he definitely, they lost a defining moment there. But Roman Reigns, you know, he's on a whole nother level right now. But unfortunately, because of pushing the bloodline storyline, because of pushing Roman to this point, they did, you know, fumble it with Drew McIntyre at in that moment. And that's not why even saying- they have to put a guy they have to put a guy like Drew McIntyre in the Intercontinental title picture so that he can stay relevant. I'm not even saying I'm not even saying that Drew McIntyre should have won. Roman should have won. Like Roman was the right guy that night, you know. I don't want to see Roman lose until WrestleMania, you know. Mm-hmm. But the fact that, you know, he just lost, he just got screwed out of the world title 
And, you know, not five minutes later, the dude's fucking singing karaoke to the fucking audience. Like, you know, oh, this was supposed to have. I'm just going to sing. I'm going to have a good time. Like, the, like, he's lost so much credibility because of that, bro. Very true. That's understandable. But I do think Pete Dunn coming back, we need to give this guy a solid push. And I think I can see him being there's US no champion. better way than to putting him in the Intercontinental or U.S. title picture. Seriously. Yeah. Because I feel like that's the only way that these Triple H guys are going to get over is if they, you know, have a title run. Yeah. My point. only my only thing is now hear me out on this. Okay. And this has nothing to do with, you know, me thinking that Sheamus is gonna win, because I do think that's what's gonna happen at Mania. Um, you know, Sheamus and Gunther had a fucking killer match at Clash of the Castle. That's like one of the defining highlights of the entire fucking show. Ask anybody. So the idea of them doing it, you know, doing a round two at WrestleMania and Sheamus getting put over that night, I mean, I mean, it just pretty much writes itself. On the main roster, on the main roster, maybe you do, maybe you don't. On the main roster, there, it's there's more storytelling aspects than there were in NXT. Pete Dunn has never really been a great promo and a great talker. How would they? How would they build this feud with Gunther and Pete Dunn if that's the way they decide to do it on the main roster. Obviously, the main roster is a little bit different than fucking NXT. You know, one thing that they could do, too, and, you know, they could give Sheamus the championship at WrestleMania and maybe SmackDown after Mania, you could have Pete Dunn attack Sheamus because of, you know, the team with the brawling brutes and, you know, build Pete Dunn as a heel. Cause I think he can get a lot more heat than get more of a baby face reaction. I enjoyed the beginning of his work in NXT UK when mm-hmm. they had this NXT UK tournament and Pete Dunn, you know, was dirty. He was a dirty player. Like, after the match, like, he would attack the person's knees. And then I remember seeing, you know, him, like, giving this cocky smirk to Triple H. And Triple H telling him to, you know, cut the shit. That's the Pete yeah. Dunn I want on the main roster. So, honestly, the more we're talking about Pete Dunn, the more I actually got to say, Danny, I want Sheamus to win at WrestleMania now. I mean, it pretty much I think that Pete itself. Dunn could be a perfect solid rivalry for Sheamus and eventually take the title off of him. And like I said, if you're going to be booking or, you know, putting Gunther towards the, the world title, you know, picture, he doesn't, he doesn't need the IC title. It's a fucking paperweight at that point. If he's going for the big title. So why not Shane? Why not put Sheamus over and Drew McIntyre is in the match. So, so Sheamus pins Drew McIntyre. Gunther loses the IC title without losing his credibility and, you know, who, I mean, he's been, he hasn't been pinned since he's been on the main roster. I don't want that to end. So you, you have here, a triple threat match. With, that's the thing with Gunter. I still want the man to be the Intercontinental Champion right now until, like, I want him to go for the world title at Survivor Series. That's where I want him to beat Cody Rhodes because I think that's just the perfect, the perfect storm the perfect opportunity would be Survivor Series. But I also understand your perspective on why Sheamus should win the championship now. It's the only title he needs left to be a Grand Slam champion. And he's had a lot of momentum since Clash at the Castle. So it only makes sense to give the guy the championship. And if they do that, you can bring in Pete Dunne to attack him and, you know, build a solid heel out of Pete Dunne. And maybe, you know, he could be one of the top heels on SmackDown. And you know, I'd be okay said, with that. Who says Sheamus needs to have a long title reign? I could see, I could see Sheamus and Pete Dunn having a feud going into SummerSlam, and potentially having Sheamus put over Pete Dunn by you know dropping or even the title money in the bank in the UK. Well, I would, ha- I mean, I would want you know Sheamus. I would want the rivalry to be built up. You know, I wouldn't like mm-hmm. you know because the Money in the Bank pay per views in what May. Money in the Bank is in July. So it's in July. So it's right around. And Summer they have Slam. backlash as well coming up. And then I think there's King and Queen of the Ring and then yeah. Money in the Bank. So you do I have think- these pay-per-views that you have to yeah. fill. Yeah. 
Because you know that I mean, Triple H is because I know because I know Triple H is doing less matches on the cards, yeah. but he's not going to you know skip an Intercontinental Title match at you know both Backlash and King of the Queen of the Ring. Exactly, and like he's going to choose you know, one of them to have the title defended. Exactly, and the fact that he wants you know he wants less matches on each card or whatever that means the matches that are, do get booked they're going to be booked with importance. He's not More just going to put. He's not just going to put, oh, you know, uh, we need we need time to fill. You two are going to be in a match tonight. Like, it, you know, every match that he's going to be booking on the shows, I mean, they're going to have some kind of significant meaning to it. And like I said, I don't think Triple H is fully, like, t- like his WWE takeover doesn't officially happen until after WrestleMania because we're going to be getting the draft. You know, there's going to be new people on Raw, new people on SmackDown. Triple H will finally be, you know, he'll be able to finally do what he wants to fucking do. That's if the old bastard doesn't fucking get in his way before then. But who knows at this point? Who knows? But guys, we'll be right back with more We Are Wrestling Podcast. It's going to be different this year. We're going to be at Dottie's house again this year. <laughs> Not one, but two, two nights. nights. <laughs> yeah, you definitely, you're definitely going to want to be there for sure. It's going to be fucking A1. Be there, be square. What is going on, everybody? Danny Elkins here, man. You guys are watching the We Are Wrestling Podcast. I want to be acknowledged! Because next week, we will be having a trailer for WrestleMania week because we have lots of awesome WrestleMania-related content coming out to the channel within the next couple weeks for Mania week that you're definitely not going to want to miss. Moving on now to the next topic on this week's episode of the We Are Wrestling Podcast. Nikki and Brie Bella making some noise. They have rebranded themselves as the Garcia twins. They have left WWE and there are some rumors that they're going to be going to AEW and Nikki on Instagram live pretty much, you know, buried those rumors and basically said, we're not going to AEW. We just wanted to, you know, see our old friends and, you know, catch up, see, you know, uncle, you know, Brian and, Yeah, there's been a lot of noise, you know, with the Bellas. We know that they have not been really happy lately in WWE. How do you feel about the Bella Twins rebranding themselves? Uh, I like it, you know. I mean, we've seen it a lot, you know. uh, Mercedes Monet, Sasha Banks, you know. I mean, that was a household name, and she, you know, totally, you know, pretty much started over in hopes of being like, you know, maybe my fans, you know, love me and appreciate me enough to follow me on this journey. And I feel like the Bella Twins or the Garcia Twins are doing the same exact thing. You know, their stepdad, John Laurinaitis, doesn't work there anymore. You know, Bree's husband, Daniel Brian Danielson, doesn't work there anymore. He's in AEW. So, you know, all the ties, all the inner ties that they had with WWE have sort of fizzled out over the last couple of years. Um, You know, and they... WWE owns the trademark Bella Twins. So like, you know, podcast, merch, all that stuff, they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to do or they would have had to give a cut of the money to WWE because they do own the trademark. So the idea of them going to or using the trademark of the Garcia Twins, I believe the Gar I believe Garcia is their actual last name. You know, they own that trademark. That's that's them. You know, so if they want to start a fashion line, if they want to, if they want to create their own merch, if they want to create their own television shows or whatever, you know, I mean, we haven't seen any trailers, but maybe Bree and Brian Danielson have some kind of, you know, involvement in this AW All Access show because obviously, you know, they're known for Total Divas and stuff like that and Total Bellas. So I mean, there's that possibility too, uh, just because they. I mean, is it possible for them, or at least for one of them, mainly Brie, because obviously she's married to Brian Danson, is it possible 
for them to make an, some kind of an appearance on AEW. Absolutely, fucking Lily, who you know, uh, Ty Valkyrie. She said that she wasn't going to be involved in anything that had to do with AEW or Jay Cargo. Turns out she was. Uh, so just because somebody says something doesn't necessarily mean it's factual information because if they were planning on going to AEW, why would they out it without having some kind of like big reveal or big debut? You know what? I mean? It'd be fucking stupid. Mm -hmm. But just because they changed their name doesn't necessarily mean, oh, you know, they're leaving WWE and they're going over here. You know, that's not the case. I think that these fans, they just need to calm down. I feel like they're just over-exaggerating, overthinking about the Bella Twins, you know, rebranding themselves as the Garcia Twins. I think they did everything that they wanted to do in WWE, even bigger. Mm -hmm. They, you know, had a very successful run as, you know, superstars. They were a part of, you know, the beginning stages of, you know, this woman's revolution. Nikki yep. Bella, in my opinion, was one of the best, you know, diva champions that they had. She really, you know, got way better in the ring at one point and had a very long title run. And Brie Bella, you know, they both had branded themselves incredibly and made Total, Total Divas very watchable. A lot of people tuned into those shows because of Brie and Nikki. And they even had their own spinoff show, Total Bellas, which was also a success. And didn't didn't Nikki just have like a spinoff show about a wedding, her wedding or something like that on, a, on, on yep. the E! Channel or something like that she that did. was involved with WWE? So. Yeah, and also she's done, they both have done a lot of things, like Nikki, she was a part of Dancing with the Stars as well, and they've had a lot of opportunities and stuff, but they always were under WWE, so a lot of the profits that they were making from E, a lot of the profits that they were making from their podcast, a lot of the mm -hmm. profits that they were making on these reality shows were going a little bit to WWE, and yep. the Bellas have done everything possible in the business, and Honestly, this is a great move for them to rebrand themselves as the Garcia twins because now, you know, they need to focus on their careers. They've done everything they could for WWE. And I think they realized that during Raw 30 when they didn't really acknowledge the Bella twins in the yep. video package because right now, WWE with the women, they're focusing on their homegrown talent like the Bianca Belairs. And Becky Lynch's and Bailey's and Charlotte Flair's. Yep. And with the Bella Twins, they've kind of gotten lost in that shuffle because they were in an era around the time where they were transitioning from divas to women. Professional exactly. Wrestlers. Exactly. And like, I do believe the, the Bella Twins, they were backstage at Raw 30. But they weren't used or whatever, so they left. I remember hearing a report about something like that. Like, they were in the same city, and then, you know, earlier that day, they were told that they weren't needed, so they left or something like that. I remember hearing. Um, that's the thing with, you know, the women's division in WWE. They're transitioning right now, and I don't think it's, you know, a bad thing. I don't think, you know, the Bellas or, you know, the Garcia twins, they're, they're not taking anything personal from it. It's just, you know, the times are changing right now. And WWE, they're really focusing on their homegrown women talent. And why I think, you know, the women wrestlers, sometimes they're more entertaining and more fascinating than the men. Because I exactly. feel like they have more larger than life characters on the women's side than the men's in exactly. WWE. And that's the thing about the Garcia twins. I think that this is a fantastic move for them because they have their own podcasts. They have their own clothing lines. They have their own businesses outside of the business. And, you know, they're both have done a fantastic job branding themselves with WWE. But now I think it's time that they, you know, focus on themselves and, you know, really grow this brand for them because they have proved that they can do it. Exactly. And like, you know, uh, over the years, you know, the Bella Twins have built, you know, they built one hell of a following for themselves on social media as well. So all the all those people, they'll be able to make the transition with them. And this way, like they can do other ventures or whatever without having to give any kind of pay cut to WWE. And like I said, you know, Bree, she's married to she's married to Brian. Nikki's married to some guy that's not even in the business. You know, John Laurinaitis, who is who is married to the Bella's mother, you know, he got he got fired. His ass, you know, goodbye. I'm surprised their mother's still with them. Um, 
but they don't all the ties that they had within WWE no no longer exist. You know, so I mean, I knew something like this was going to happen, especially when I think it, I can't remember if it was Brie or Nikki. One of them went on a rant about how the women are being booked. I remember it was after the cage match on Raw 30. I remember, there was supposed to be a cage match with Becky mm-hmm. Lynch and it didn't end up happening because they were going over time. And one of the Bellas went on Instagram live and started complaining about the way WWE is handling the women's division. So I knew something like this was going to happen. I wasn't sure how when or why you know but just because they they're rebranding themselves doesn't automatically mean oh they're jumping ship to aw it's not the way they're, it works and they're not and, anti wwe it's yeah. just they've had this teamwork with wwe for so long that it's kind of you know run dry and they've done everything they wanted to do even more And I think that WWE, you know, they're on a different page right now. And I think, you know, the Garcia twins, they're also on a different page right now. And this opens the door for them because now they can do, you know, meet and greets and they can, you know, do opportunities like Brie. We could see her on AEW in, you know, these video packages maybe coming up with Brian Danielson because didn't Brian Danielson say he wanted to go home? Now you can have her. You know, they can do scenes with her and him in their house and having Bree, you know, pretty much try to get him to get back in that ring. Exactly. And like, you know, there's more opportunities for them as the Garcia twins and the Bella twins. Circumstances, circumstances are way different for Nikki than Bree. Like I said, you know, Bree is married to Brian. He's, you know, a mainstay on AW. Um, so I could see her making sporadic appearances. Like I said, we haven't seen it in the trailer, but we've only seen like maybe one or two episodes in the AW All Access show. Who's to say? Who's to say? You know, they haven't filmed anything for that. You know, who knows how long they they've obviously been filming. You know, since the beginning of at least 2022, maybe the end of 2021. There's a lot of footage. Obviously, who's to say they're not involved in the show somehow? We just haven't seen it yet. And that's the thing, like, the last thing I'm going to say, you know, about the Garcia twins, you know, good for them. I'm very happy that, you know, they decided to rebrand themselves because there's a lot of former WWE stars that, you know, really try to fight to, you know, get their WWE name and stuff. And the Bellas, you know, are now taking a chance. And I think they have a, you know, perfect amount of following to do this. And remind you, at the end of the day, You know, they both have so much things going on outside of the business that I don't see them ever coming back full time ever Mm -hmm. again in AEW or anywhere else. I think that, yeah, they can make, you know, sporadic, you know, appearances. But at the end of the day, I think they're focusing on their businesses and most importantly, their kids. Exactly. You know, and I do have a feeling that they're making just as much, if not more money you know, doing their other stuff outside of pro wrestling than they were when they were on WWE. So exactly. And they have had a fantastic run as well, but moving on now to our last topic, before we get into the main event topic for this week, the 50th episode of the podcast, LA Knight. There are big plans for him in WWE. He is set to get a big push after WrestleMania. What should they do with LA Knight? Yeah. Yeah. LA Knight, bro, like, that dude is so over, man. Like, I'm so happy. Notice how when Triple H took over Creator back in August, that was one of the first things that he did. He took LA Knight out of this stupid Maximum Male Model gimmick because he knew the the amount of charisma and the amount of fucking the, the talent this guy has. He's yeah. not gonna be, he's not going to be stuck wearing a fucking stupid-ass suit. Triple, that, was one of the fir- that was one of the first things Triple H did. He was like, yeah, bro, you're fucking LA yeah. Knight again. Um, that's fucking annoying, bro. What is this? Whole, this is like the what movement all over again, man. Yeah, I have heard. I, I have all heard. Right, that's the last time I do it. I have heard reports that LA Knight could possibly be having um some kind of uh match or whatever at WrestleMania with Steve Austin. And you know, again, this isn't totally my idea. I heard somebody else talk about this. But what if you have a story going into Mania, right, built up over the next couple of weeks? What if you have like LA Knight, you know, he's like cutting promos, he's like pressing, he he's pressing, you know, WWE management. He wants to get on WrestleMania. He wants to get on the WrestleMania card. You know, he's he's going to he's going to, you know, do a hostile takeover at WrestleMania if he can't get a match that night. 
So at WrestleMania, you have him sit in the crowd, kind of like John Cena did when when the Undertaker called him out with a microphone. He's, he's sitting. He's sitting in the crowd. He has a hostile takeover. You hear the glass shatter, man. Steve Austin comes out, confronts him, and you know you want a match, motherfucker. Well, you got one, and you know it's pretty much becomes like a like a match slash Unsanctioned brawl, kind of kind of like what him and KO did. I bro, that would fucking steal the fucking show for me, man. That'd Honestly, be awesome. I would be all for that because that is the thing. WWE, they're very satisfied with, you know, the reactions that he's been getting with the crowd. And that's something with these Triple H guys that they are absolutely struggling with really badly. But LA Knight knows how to do it. And this is something that I've noticed from him because I've been a fan of his work since, you know, he first started in Impact Wrestling as Eli, Eli Drake. Drake. The dummy, yeah, dummy. I knew they had a star in him. When he cut that first promo with, you know, the BCC with Drew McIntyre and Camacho. When I saw that promo that he cut, I knew immediately, wow, Impact, they got themselves a superstar. Bro, the first time he went to WWE, man, I knew immediately when they made that sign. Oh, man, when this guy gets to the main roster, he's going to be a star. Bro, the first time I saw um, LA Knight was... It was, it, he was in a feud with, um, Cameron Grimes, Cameron Grimes. And they had Ted DiBiase involved or whatever. And I remember like, you know, Ted DiBiase would be out like, you know, trying to buy a house or whatever. And Cameron Grimes would steal it from out underneath him. And, you know, LA Knight and Cameron Dr- Grimes would feud or whatever. And then remember Ted DiBiase brought out the million dollar championship. Loved it. Like that was some of the, that was some of the best stuff ever, bro. And that's the thing with LA Knight. He's so talented that he can make anything he does work. And I'm so glad to see him getting the yeah thing over with, you know, the main roster. Could he you imagine? He deserves it. Could you imagine him and Steve Austin in the same ring with microphones? One's going what? One's going yeah, bro. See who can get. I mean, bro, the story writes itself. And Steve Austin. He would make L.A. Knight look like a million bucks. Guess what? L.A. Knight would make Steve Austin look like a million bucks, bro. Book that fucking match, Trips. You put you put Austin doing the what, and you put him doing the yeah. That's going to get the yeah thing even more over. And as a heel, L.A. Knight knows how to make it work. And even if he's a babyface doing the yeah thing, he's going to be able to make it work. But imagine, you know, he gets sick of the crowd going, yeah, similar to Kurt Angle with the you suck stuff. This has big potential to turn this kid from a star to a superstar. Even and I think what's what going to happen this? after WrestleMania. What about this before you before you continue? What about this? What about you have Steve Austin show up, stun stun LA Knight, and then they carry the match over to maybe have backlashes on. That way you can have some kind of more build to it instead of Austin just showing up. But you still have them face to face at Mania. Unless you oh have them face to face at Mania, and then they make the match for night two, that could be too. Like, there's so much potential here, bro. Book here's that what I think is going match. to happen now with LA Knight after WrestleMania. A lot of people are talking about how he's going to get a title picture, this and that. I don't think he needs a title just yet. I think what's going to happen after WrestleMania, they are going to put LA Knight in storylines with WWE guys. I think that we're going to see him, you know, feuding with some of the most popular guys in the business. I could see him and Seth Rollins having a feud for a couple months. I could see him and AJ Styles working a feud for a few months. I could see him and Randy Orton working a feud together for a few months. He's going to be working with popular WWE baby faces, I think. I could kind of see him working with somebody like Karrion Cross as well. You know, Karen Cross is. Like, I don't think right away because what they're gonna do, I think after WrestleMania, I would have Karen Cross guys, to Judgment Day. Yes, that's what they need to do. But I think with a lot of these Triple H guys, that's what they need to do is put these guys in storylines with popular WWE stars that are already over. There's a reason why LA Knight got over in the Bray Wyatt thing. Yes, the payoff. You know, a lot of people weren't satisfied with you know this neon, you know, black light match. But when it comes down to it, he got over because Bray Wyatt, the fans are paying attention to him. They love Bray Wyatt. 
mm-hmm. you put L.A. Knight in these feuds with Seth Rollins, who you have, you know, the crowd singing his music. You put him in a feud with Randy Orton, who's, you know, a legend in the business. You put him in a feud with the phenomenal one, AJ Styles. It's only going to get L.A. Knight more over. And that's what they need to do with, you know, Johnny wrestling. They need to do with Bronson Reed. They need to do with Karrion Cross. And I think Johnny wrestling, what they got to do with him, when Tomasa Champa comes back, bring back DUI. That's what, that's what that's needs to That's the best happen, way right? to get both of them two over and then do exactly what you did in NXT. You know, keep them together for like a year and then have one of them turn on the other. And there you go. That's when and the momentum will pick there. up. And bring back their old fucking entrance music, bro. I'm sick of these fucking stupid ass remixes of the songs that they use, and they're bro, they're fucking atrocious. I have to mute the TV. Yeah, but I think you know, with LA Knight, he absolutely deserves this big push after Mania. He showed that he can be a star in WWE. Even with you know the bad feud with Bray Wyatt, he still got himself over. Even with him losing the match, remind you. And that's something that's very hard in today's wrestling is to get over even after you lose. And with somebody like Bray Wyatt, who, you know, we talked about on the extra earlier this week, where, you know, a lot of his storylines, you know, it's one way and like it only, you know, benefits Bray Wyatt's character. So having, you know, LA Knight being put over, like putting himself over in a situation where Bray Wyatt, you know, beat him and stuff. And he's still over with the crowd. That just shows you everything you need to know. And this man needs to, you know, get this push. And uh, and, like to speak on that for a minute, like Bray Wyatt, I think this whole gothic character can work. I just don't feel like all this like paranormal witchcraft kind of stuff. I don't I don't think it's necessarily needed. And if it is needed, you know, do it for like segments or whatever. I don't think that stuff needs to translate over into like an in-ring capacity. The problem is with Bray Wyatt is there's too many questions every time he's cutting a promo. And a lot of us fans, you have to realize, especially in 2023, we're impatient fucks. Just give us the damn answers. We're waiting. It's like one of those like kid cartoon shows. You watch Dora and she says, where is, where is boots? And you know, they have that like waiting thing. For like a few minutes until, you know, they show like pretty much like the mouse, like, you know, pointing at where it is with Bray Wyatt, the mouse thing isn't showing up. So it's like, you're sitting there like Bray Wyatt's Dora. And he's saying, where's the monkey? That's the problem with Bray Wyatt. We have the attention span of fucking snails. Yes, we do. But guys, before we get into our main event topic for this week, we'll be right back with more We Are Wrestling podcast. Every superstar was, there were so many great superstars back then, and they focused on the show. What happened in the ring took care of itself. I have enjoyed tag team wrestling more now than I ever have in my entire life. And I think a lot of it has to do with AEW, you know, tag team matches, especially the pay-per-views. Those crowds back then, fans were, wrestling fans were wrestling fans. With old school wrestling, the only thing I criticize is the pace of matches. I think when it comes to old school, it's for me a little too slow. Characters, on the other hand, they're on a whole nother level. You can see your hands a little too close. Honestly, I would rather take the belt that I'm wearing on my pants. <laughs> I'd rather be representing that than the fucking <laughs> the new WWE championship, okay? <laughs> new episodes of Old School vs. New School air every Monday only on We Are Wrestling. Action. <clears throat> what is up? We are Wrestling Maniacs. I'm better than Ben. I'm better than Danny. You know the usual. The thousands of subscribers. It's, re- it's recording. Bro. Oh, it's recording. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Three, two, one. What is up? We are Wrestling Maniacs out there worldwide. I'm the host with the most, the best one, Donnie, and you're listening to the We Are Wrestling Talk Show. Fuck the Lone Rager and fuck Danny Huckins because you're here to listen to the best one, Donnie, on 
the We Are Wrestling Talk Show. The host with the most, baby. Woo! We're back. Our main event topic for episode 50 of the We Are Wrestling Podcast. This one, I think, is definitely worthy of our main event topic for this week. And it's about the Tribal Chief. The man who is, you know, the WWE Universal Champion for over 900 days. The leader of the bloodline, Roman Reigns. And during a recent interview with AP News, John Cena thinks Roman Reigns should be in the GOAT discussions. So during the interview, John Cena said, and I quote, When I'm there as a performer, it's Roman Reigns' show. In my mind... He needs to be in the conversation, and in my mind, he's the greatest of all time. How do you feel about these comments made by one of the best in WWE history, John Cena, praising Roman uh, Reigns? I d- it's definitely warranted. Like, when was the last time we had a guy as dominant as Roman Reigns? Like, um, you know, I can't think of I can't think of one. I don't even think Triple H has ever had a fucking reign this long. You know, I feel like Roman Reigns is at a whole nother level compared to how he was, you know, a baby face, a member of the shield, whatever, you know, he became the, his baby face run didn't really translate. I feel like I'm the only person on this planet that didn't fucking hate the guy. Um, and, you know, which is kind of crazy he, to me. He, he, think he was a he, he was a heel. And then he had this whole cancer thing come out and he was immediately a fucking baby face again. Um, Roman Reigns is just on a whole nother level. So I do feel like you got to add him to the to the discussion of being a go um but i you know i i've been saying this for a while and i think we i think we've even touched on it on the podcast and maybe even just you know talking one-on-one or whatever i do feel like if it wasn't for Sami Zayn, the bloodline storyline would have fucking died out like there it was just it was losing so much interest and then you involve somebody like Sami Zayn in the mix don't forget I mean, solo sakola too so Sokoa too at uh, Clash of the Castle. We saw his debut helping uh, Roman against uh, Drew McIntyre. Um, so I mean, with him having as a dominant title reign, granted, it's you know it's pretty much kind of predictable. You know, he especially like when he first started this whole you know bloodline, you know tribal chief um, storyline or whatever. He didn't necessarily have the competition. As like I like to say, just like the Usos, you know, their champion, they don't really have the competition. It's not like Roman Reigns was like smack dab in the Attitude Era. In the Attitude Era, man, you had Rock, you had Austin, you had Triple H, you had Kane, you had Undertaker, you had all these guys, you know, and like you know, it's we're in a different time now. So the I you don't have six or seven huge gigantic main event superstars you know, battling each other for the title anymore. It's not like that anymore. You know what I mean? So I, I guess you can you can add him to the, the GOAT discussion. Just know that times are times have changed over the last 20 years. Absolutely. And my thoughts about these comments that were made with Roman Reigns, and this is coming from, you know, somebody that really wasn't a fan of Roman Reigns after the Shield broke up. I felt like Vince McMahon was really trying to shove him down our throats and with the whole, you know, this is my yard, you know, the big dog stuff. It was just so forced. Like they were trying to force him as a baby face and I didn't I didn't like that at all. I don't like to be forced, you know, anything. I like, you know, when it's natural. I love yep. when somebody gets over natural. There's a reason why, you know, Hulk Hogan was one of the best in the business. Austin 316, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, Triple H, John Cena, and all of these guys, Batista, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar. It was all natural with them getting over. And for Roman Reigns, unfortunately, you know, the beginning of his career, it wasn't like that. They tried everything they could to, you know, get this man over and make him a big star. Little did they know, all they had to do was turn the man heel. It kind of that man some creative freedom, and look what happened. It kind of feels like, and you got to have obviously add Paul Heyman to the mix because Paul Heyman, Paul Heyman is a bigger part to the storyline than people realize. I feel like 
But yeah. I feel I feel like when Roman Reigns, you know, was getting all kinds of hate and he was, you know, they were trying to force him to be a baby face and stuff like that. I feel like it was almost like the same situation with Cody Rhodes. You know, everybody wanted him. He was a baby face. Everybody wanted him to fucking be heel. And, you know, it, you know, he's continuing to be a baby face. But, like, you know, I feel like the same thing goes for, you know, Roman Reigns and the fact that, you know, he was a baby face. Everybody fucking hated him. Cody Rhodes was a baby face. Everybody fucking hated him. You know what I mean? And something I always say in sports entertainment and professional wrestling is timing is everything. And the timing, you know, worked perfect for Roman Reigns to, you know, have this turn with Paul Heyman. And then you get Jay Uso in the mix. Then you get Jimmy in the mix. Starts to get a little bit, you know, repetitive. So they add Sami Zayn in there to really add more to the characters, to add more to the Bloodline storyline. Then we get Solo Sokola because Drew McIntyre, if Solo didn't get in there, we all know McIntyre was going to win that match. You needed a guy like Solo Sokola in the group. And it really Mm -hmm. completed everything in this story from start to finish. And I think, you know, with, you know, Roman Reigns, it's time fans really start putting him in the GOAT discussions because I understand the competition is not as hot as it once was. We had, you know, the 80s where, in the 90s, where characters were larger than life. You had Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Macho Man. Then you go from that to the Attitude Era, where we have Stone Cold, The Rock, Triple H, Undertaker, Kane, to Ruthless Aggression, John Cena, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, Batista, these guys that came from OVW, to now. And let's be honest, there isn't really one of those John Cena guys. And Roman Reigns, with this character, you know, really took a lot and learned and, you know, used all that aggression that he built for years, you know, pretty much being the baby face, having to suck up all the hate that he was getting from the crowd. Because you know how bad he wanted to go out and, you know, put all of us on blast for booing the shit out of him and, you know, yeah. coming at him for pretty much everything. He finally, you know, the timing was right and he executed it perfectly. And right now there's nobody on Roman Reigns pedestal in WWE. And that's the thing you have to realize 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years from now. The times are always going to change. They're never going to be the same like it once was when we were younger. And Mm -hmm. let's say the next go 10 years from now is Braun Breaker. Obviously, a lot of people are going to be looking back and they're going to say, well, Braun Breaker didn't have anything on Roman Reigns or John Cena or The Rock or Stone Cold. But because of the times, it's whoever is the best and the needle mover. And Roman Reigns... One thing you can't, you have to admit is the man is a needle mover. He puts asses in seats. When I was at the Survivor Series with Ben live in Boston, when that music hit, I felt it through my entire body. And I felt when I was holding up the one while he was coming out with the bloodline, you felt it. Exactly. You know, and people need, people also need to realize that, you know, the bloodline storyline works. Because you have all these different elements that bring the entire picture together, you know Everything. it's like it's it's like a it's like a work of art, bro. If you it's don't a have TV if, show, if you don't have paper, if you don't have pencils, if you don't have markers, if you don't have color, what it's not really it's not necessarily a picture, is it? You know, you got to have all these elements that go along with it to put it all together. You know what I mean? So that's the reason why it works and it's so captivating because you have all these different personalities mixed in and, you know, it adds it adds a little bit of excitement. I haven't been this excited for a storyline since God, maybe John Cena and Edge or Matt Hardy and Edge. You know what I mean? And that's the thing, like when there when you have these different personalities And, you know, everything just works. That's when things are very successful. There's a reason why MTV, Jersey Shore, it was so popular because you had, you know, eight different strangers that had all different personalities, even though they all were Italians, 
they all had different personalities and they made, you know, MTV, you know, one of the most successful networks out there with WWE, with the bloodline, you're watching Monday night raw, but the bloodline is so fascinating that I feel like I'm watching my, I'm watching its own show on top of watching Monday night raw, which makes it fantastic as a viewer, because I'm going in every Monday well, technically for me, because I watch it the day after, every Tuesday and every Saturday, going, what's going to happen now with the bloodline? Jimmy's pissed. Jay's happy. Sammy is just friggin' losing his mind. Sola Sokola is just Sola Sokola. And Paul Heyman, the wise man, he's still kissing Roman Reigns' ass. Like, I, every week there's always something to it, and it makes you, as a viewer, so fascinated, and it's made Roman Reigns even more godly than he was. Exactly. And you know, like if he, if it was just him and Paul, it would, it would, it would be different, but it, I've, it, he would get the same reaction, but it's this storyline has formed into something ungodly because you do have all these different elements that go along with it. You know, the beginning of the tribal chief storyline, it all started with Roman choking out the Usos inside his, inside a steel cage inside Hell the Hell in a cell. cell, and now you have, you know, he's pretty much beat and built up his cousins to being like an ungodly force in the tag team division. Look at Solo Sokoa. The way he's booked on the main roster is com- like a one eighty compared to how he was on fucking NXT. Wait you know, until like, this man. Wait till after WrestleMania for Solo Sokola. You talk about LA Knight getting you big know. Bush. I honestly, Ooh, I, I can't wait. I this honestly think after this bloodline things. Away. I on, I honestly think that before this is all said and done, I could see Jay Uso getting revenge on Roman Reigns for you know choking him out in the side the inside the Hell in Cell. I could see that being a real before Roman's gone. I could see that being a very real possibility because once the Usos lose the tag titles and Roman potentially loses the, the world title at WrestleMania, all bets are off. Once they lose the titles, bro, all bets are fucking off. It's a movie right now, and we're so close to the ending of the movie, and I think when we get to the end of the movie, we're all going to be shocked. We're all going to be saying, holy shit. And that's the best thing about the Bloodline movie so far. Every mm-hmm. time we think that the end is there, it's not over. We exactly. thought the end was going to be at Clash of the Castle when McIntyre won. Oh, no, we were just getting started. We go into Survivor Series. We thought right there, that was going to be the end. Sammy was going to help Kevin. Nope, they continued the story. Then the Royal Rumble happens. We thought it was going to be the end. Nope. And that's the best part about this right now is... The ending, we're so close to it, and when it happens, it's going to really hit us. And now, not only do you have the bloodline storyline between Roman, the Uso, Solo, Paul, you know, and you did have Sammy, but take Sammy out of the bloodline equation. But now, another story has resurfaced off the tail of that between Sammy Zayn, Cody Rhodes, and Kevin Owens. So it's like building its own universe around itself, bro. And this I whole- love the way, and at first, I thought Sami Zayn should have been main eventing against Roman, and I'm proud to say I was wrong because now they got Ro- they got Cody Rhodes involved in the perfect way. Kevin Owens, the little things that they do with this whole bloodline thing. Kevin Owens in the interview when he said, Cody, focus on Roman, get the title off of him, and stay out of my fucking business. That made so much sense because Kevin Owens is sick of Roman's title run. He knows Cody can take the titles off of him. So why is Cody going to risk him getting hurt helping Kevin out? It all makes sense and it's fantastic. They've done a great job here. And Cody and Roman being face-to-face for the first time, for me, that sold me for the main event of WrestleMania. And, And obviously this podcast is coming out on Saturday. We're gonna have Roman Reigns on Monday Night Raw on Monday, so uh, I guess all, it's all it's all coming full circle, bro. We're the closer we get to WrestleMania, the more hectic shit is gonna become. Time to put, and the last thing I'm gonna say here is time to start putting respect on Roman Reigns' name seriously. 
because I without the one. bloodline, because there would be no bloodline without the tribal chief himself, Roman Reigns. There wouldn't, but you, like I like I said, like I said earlier, man, this is the best like, work he's done in his career. But it's I. You got to also throw the Uso, Solo, and Paul in there because you know he could be the tribal chief all he wants. But if he doesn't have all these different elements to go along with it, it wouldn't be as impactful. Oh no, absolutely no. You're absolutely correct. It's like a basketball team. You have your all star, you have your superstar, and then you have you know the team players. And that's the thing, you know, without the superstar, you can't get the championship, but you also need the team players. And I'm not trying to take anything away from the rest of the bloodline because they all did a fantastic job. And after this, they all got more over than they were. But Mm -hmm. Roman Reigns, because of him being the superstar, he's going to get more of the media attention and, you know, more of the recognition because right now John Cena is going on interviews praising Roman Reigns that he is one of the greatest of all time. And that's why, you know, I'm saying to leave this topic to what I got to say is it's time to start putting respect on Roman Reigns name as one of the goats in this business. He's 100% agree. 100% agree, man. It's going to be crazy. Make sure you guys subscribe, turn the bell for all notifications. And uh, we have a lot of WrestleMania content coming, man. So subscribe. Damn it. That's right. But if you guys enjoyed this week's episode of the We Are Wrestling Podcast, make sure to smash that like button now. Let us know in the comment section below your thoughts on the topics we talked about in this episode. Pretty lengthy episode, but there was a lot of hot topics that Danny and I really wanted to dive into and give you guys our thoughts. And we really love to analyze this stuff and really go into detail. If you're not a We Are Wrestling Maniac yet already, subscribe, turn on the post notifications. The link's down in the description below. You can go follow Danny and I on our social medias and other YouTube pages. All that down below. In addition, you want shorter clips of the podcast that we do here on the We Are Wrestling channel. Follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. All that down below. And over on Facebook and Instagram, we are doing $25 Amazon gift card giveaways on there. All you got to do is go on to the page and do what it says. All the links down below. And, of course, to all the We Are Wrestling Maniacs out there worldwide, thank you for 50 episodes because now we are on the road to episode 100. You already know we are taking over. Peace. Come out and see us at the Wrestling Classic 3.